Um, so, I'll get started. Welcome everybody to the uh, final day of this Axion Cosmology course. Um, so, I'll, 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 recap, I'll recap yesterday for, um, for a minute, um, because today we're going to be talking about what I call the halo scope new way. Uh, this picture has nothing to do with axions, just because I like it to it. Um, so the, oh, before I do that, you may, you may have noticed I had a symbol on like most of my, on a lot of my slides throughout the whole, um, throughout the whole course. And you should be able to figure out why, why, what, what this symbol significance is for accidents now. So I had this symbol of a Sumi circle on all of the slides. Um, and some of you have heard, me, heard why I used this before probably. Um, so a Sumi circle is a, a Buddhist symbol that represents emptiness and the void, so I think it's quite appropriate for dark matter for one, but it's also very appropriate for axioms because it's obviously a um, you want symmetry that's anomalously broken by some hands. So that's why the Sumi circle represents axioms. Um, okay, um, but apex theorem has nothing to do with axioms. So yesterday we talked about direct detection of axioms. We talked about and, and, and I put this, I put a lot of the direct detection of axions on this plot um, of the, say, axion photon coupling versus mass in a, on a log scale. And the QCD axion models are a line on here. Um, for dark matter, there's a maximum mass that we're interested in, about 1 EV. The axion has to be lighter than 1 EV, or else it's not correctly produced by a misalignment. It's instead produced thermally in the top dark matter. We then looked at some various constraints that we can get on this coupling. Um, we got a very nice baseline from stellar evolution. We then um, looked at laboratory searches. We had light shining through a wall. We had uh, helioscopes, axions from the sun. But none of these told us too much about dark matter axions. And then we talked about the ADMX cavity experiment and other, and other cavities that take this small chunk out of axial parameter space at about a micro electron volt. And, and these type of cavity heliscopes in the future plan to extend their reach, but they have a limited range. To, because they work on magnetic fields, they work on physical size resonances, so they can't be too big and they can't be too small, and the size roughly sets. Their size is roughly avoided the action Compton wavelength. So you're kind of limited just by the physical, the physical um, process that you're using. But we also saw, I gave a preview of the, of the future, and um, that axial searches are getting very popular at the moment, and there are lots of ideas and today we're going to talk about ideas that go to lower masses and ideas that go to higher masses. And so this is what I call the, the Hemoscope New Wave. Um, and we already started on this process yesterday. Um, so yesterday I introduced the first of the, of the Hemoscope New Wave experiments, which is um, Mad Max, um, which is a very exciting experiment that's very likely um, going to get built with Daisy. Um, I mean, it, is, it may even be under construction already, I don't know the complete status. So Mad Max works on the principle of trying to detect the axial photon coupling that we talked about already. And it works via, you have, via doing it in two different mediums. So this is just axial electrodynamics. You modify Maxwell's equations. You, the axion is a source, a, like a new type of source in Maxwell's equations to dark matter. And this produces an electric field. You balance these at the boundary, and your and your dielectric disks emit axions. And if you arrange them correctly, you can have coherent enhancements of this effect. So Mad Max basically extends the reach of the traditional halo scope idea by allowing you to have both resonance and coherent enhancements, and so you can operate over a wider range of frequencies. So we already saw this. This is the prototype of Mad Max. This is a schematic drawing. We talked about its magnet. 35 kilometers of superconducting cable. Um, and we saw that the forecasts from Mad Max extend the reach. So the traditional halo scopes are in green. And Mad Max extends the reach of this to higher masses 
by about an order of magnitude. So Mad Max on a diagram would sit somewhere here as a, as a forecast, and the maximum masses that um, they choose to operate to is about 10 to the minus 4 electron volts. So there is still some way to go at high masses and at low masses, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so today. The first experiment I want to tell you about is called Abracadabra. Um, great exercise in acronym making by the authors. I actually saw one of the April Fool's papers uh, this year. Um, an astronomer has written a command line bit of code. You just, like pip install it, and they generate acronyms for you. So you write anything that you you write um, any phrase that you want to use, and then using any letters in that word, it gives you all possible um, acceptable English la English language words that you can make out of that word um, to save all this time that you would have to spend thinking of acronyms. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, many people will be out of, out of the job. Okay, so uh, Abracadabra works by this principle of axion electrodynamics. So you have Maxwell's equations, an axion, an axion source. The axion source is oscillating because you've got um, because it's the dark matter background field, and it looks like a pseudo magnetic field. So just like magnetic fields can source currents, the axion field can also source a current. And this is what it looks, and this is what they do, and they do it in this special in this special geometry. So they have an applied magnetic field going around their toroid, and then they and then the axion field um, induces a current, I think, through the um, axis of the toroid, which you then detect with a, with um, a squid pickup loop. So you have your magnetic field, and then your axion induces a, a current perpendicular to it, which you detect. And the, um, this is, uh, it, it doesn't work just on resonance. So, you, so this, is an actually, this is an LC circuit. And you can arrange that the resonant frequency of your circuit is the axion frequency. So this allows you to have resonance at frequencies that aren't tied to the physical size of the thing. So one, that's good. Um, uh, but they also work off resonance. They can also do broadband searches. The axion couples into your system via the, Applied magnetic field, so it's producing an electric field. Actually, a applied magnetic field produces um, an electric field like this. Um, and yeah, they can work. So, so you want to have high magnetic fields, and you can work off resonance. And it has a really, a really broadband um, search reach. So that's what their acronym stands for, a broadband resonant approach to cosmic axion detection with an amplified B-ring, B-field ring apparatus. Um, okay, and this was proposed in 2016 um, <laughs> by Yoni Khan, Ben Safdi, and Jesse Parler, some theorists at MIT. But it's already been built, or at least the prototype has. So um, the prototype for it, called Abra 10 centimeters, which is actually 12 centimeters, has been built in the basement um, at MIT in, in Lindsay Winslow's lab. So this is now the, the, ex, the proper, um, proper CAD drawing of it by um, experimentalists. So here's your toroid or magnet. Here's the bit in the middle where you stick your squid pickup loop to detect the induced current caused by the axiom. But it's gone even beyond that. It's actually been built, ab Abra 10 centimeters, their small test run has been built and has taken data already. So these, you know, are, are kind of almost tabletop experiments. They're things that can be done in a lab in a university in two years. Uh, so that's pretty amazing, I think. And that's why a lot of people are interested in these axion searches because they're quite, they're, it's quite easy to, not easy, it's accessible to make real headway relatively quickly. Um, so it's quite exciting for experimentalists as well as theorists. So here's a picture of Abra. Here's their nice toroidal magnet. That's, of course, as with Mad Max, it's the, 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 one of the main costs is the magnet. And here it is. It's housed in some cryostat. And then you measure the 
measure whether there's an induced signal. And of course, there isn't an induced signal. They're just setting limits at the moment. They don't expect the signal with their, um, with their test ABRA 10 centimeters. ABRA 10 centimeters picked up this limit on the axial photon coupling as a function of mass. The, they are still inside the exclusion set by helioscopes. So to put this on our plot here, you notice the mass scale is really low, about 10 to minus 9 electron volts. So they're way below the ADMX surges. But at the moment, they're still inside the exclusion set by, sol set by surges for solar axions. But as I said, this is just a prototype, and they only scanned for um, one month. And this was in the non-resonant mode, this was in broadband mode. Okay, but they've also made some forecasts for how well they'll do in the future. It wouldn't be exciting if all these edwards we can't get outside the class limit. These are their forecasts. So the Abra 10 centimeters um, prototype, if once it runs for its full course, is forecast to reach below the cast line and extend all the way up to meet the ADMX exclusions, which are here in red and the forecasts are in are in lighter red. They're on their resonant modes, they don't have as much reach obviously, but on resonance you can um, you achieve a higher signal power. So the resonant modes are this band and this band. In their resonant mode, they expect to be able to reach right next to ADMX here, and then at a slightly lower mass over here. And then they have a plan for upgrades, of course, in order to try and reach um, exclusions on the QCD axion, then a 75 centimeter version, and then full maxi you know, maximum capacity, what they call Abra QCD, which could really make this constraint at the QCD axion. So their aim is to constrain the QCD axion in both broadband and resonance um, between 10 to the minus nine and 10 to the minus seven electron volts. So that's already two orders of magnitude. I mean, on this plot, the resonance search doesn't look like it's making a big dent, but it's two orders of magnitude on the QCD axion, and it almost meets up with the lower mass part of ADMX. And if you remember when we discussed black hole super radiance, black hole super radiance excludes the QCD axion between about 10 to the minus 10 and about 10 to the minus 12 EV. So black hole super radiance has already kicked in here. So Abra almost fills all of the lower um, of the lower mass part of the QCD axion below um, ADMX. So it's very exciting. It doesn't get all of the lower mass part. And just like many of the searches we've heard about, it's only sensitive to the axial photon coupling, which means you can't do model discrimination. And you've always got this degeneracy that it's not really fair to put the haloscope searches on the same plane as the helioscope and other searches, because haloscopes are really sensitive to the value of the axial field times the, times the coupling constant, which means they're really sensitive to the square roots of the dark matter density times the coupling constant. Because if you remember, the dark matter density goes at the field value squared. So you can never break that degeneracy with a single experiment. If you made a detection, you wouldn't know whether you detected the QCD axion or an axion-like particle with a smaller density. So you need searches with um, different couplings. And we're still missing the high mass. So moving on to searches with different couplings, and this is one of the other major developments going on at the moment, and again, it's going on um, partially in Germany and partially in the United States. So this is an experiment called CASPER, which stands for the Cosmic Axion Spin Precession Experiment. And they do use the small r here, um, not a typo on my, on my part. So it's a nuclear magnetic resonance heliscope. So th this was an idea that was proposed in this paper I mentioned by Graham and Rajendran in 2013. And then again in a paper uh, with Dmitry Budke and Alex Shushkov um, in 2014, where they did the full experimental proposal. And um, so this, this was an idea that Graham and Rajendran hit, hit upon. And, um, and uh, I heard that when they, they took it to an experimentalist and said, what, like, what's this? And they said, oh, you've just reinvented NMR. So then they were like, okay, great. We can use all this existing NMR technology to search for axions. 
So it works on two different of the axion couplings. There's Casper Electric, which works on the dipole coupling of the axion. Remember, I introduced this already. This is the coupling. This is the coupling in the Lagrangian that emerges from the axion coupling to GG dual, the blue on field strength. And then after confinement, after QCD confinement, this leads to a coupling between the axion field, the nucleon bilinear, uh, sigma mu nu, which is sort of spin matrix. Um, it's the anti com, I think it's the anti commutator gamma mu gamma mu. Then nucleon, then nucleon bilinear, then F mu nu. So this emerges from the uh, nucleon, so this gives you a dipole moment, F mu nu being the electric field strength tensor. So this is the thing that solves the Q, this is the thing that solves the Strong's P problem. So what you're looking for is that the QCD axiom doesn't set the dipole moment of the neutron to zero, it instead makes it oscillate at the axiom natural frequency. Dipole moment oscillates at cosine nt. So this is then the idea, you apply, you take a spin polarized NMR sample, so something like three helium, or, or, or some kind of liquid xenon, and then you apply a magnetic field, and this causes all the, spin, all the nuclear spins to line up and gives you a magnetization. Then, if there's a dipole moment, you apply, when you apply an electric field, there should also be a, a precession, a spin precession about that axis. But the spin precession is now not at the uh, nuclear llama frequency, but is at the frequency set by the oscillation of the axion field. So you have a precession of the dipole moment um, so you now have a precession of the dipole moments around this axis at a different frequency, but you can tune it. So the, so the, nu so the NMR sample will be spin precessing at the, at the nuclear llama frequency set by this B. So it has a frequency equal to mu B times B times B external. And now you can tune the llama precession frequency to be resonant with the precession frequency with the axiom. And this now enhances your signal because you have resonance. And so you induce some anomalous magnetization and you can measure this with your, with a squid. And then the other, the other experiment, which works on the same principle, but with a different axiom coupling, is, Cas is called Casper wind. So Casper wind is exactly the same idea, but you don't need the applied electric field but you measure a different axiom coupling. So now we've got the other term in our Lagrangian, which is B mu phi psi bar gamma mu gamma phi psi, coupling between the axion and the fermion um, axial current. This means that your axion couples to the fermion spins, and you can write this coupling as the axion again looking like an effective magnetic field. So it modifies Maxwell's equations, and it looks like an effective magnetic field that couples the fermion spins. But now the vector in the problem is the gradient of the axion field. So it's like gradient axion field dot fermion spin. So the gradient of the axion field is, of course, in the direction of the velocity in the galactic halo. Gradients are the momentum operator, so the direction of the velocity is the direction of the gradients. So now you've got this set up here. It looks just like the other one, except the role of the electric field, the additional axis about which you'll induce anomalous precession, is now the direction of the dark matter wind. This is why it's called Casper wind. And it couples to this G5 nucleon couple. Both of these experiments are really cool because there are new axion coupling. The axion nucleon coupling, the laboratory constraints come, for example, from fifth forces. There are constraints from stellar cooling, similar to the constraints in the photon plane. Again, there are constraints from stellar cooling on this dipole moment coupling and also from BBN. Um, so you're getting to new couplings. You're, and you're also, you've got an advantage over, um, say, a cavity halo-scope because you tune the resonant frequency of this experiment by changing your applied magnetic field. So you don't need to do anything mechanical. 
and you take some NMR sample, you put it in a magnet, and then you tune your magnet to change the resonance frequency. The dark matter wind might sound like, if you, if you haven't studied dark matter before, how the hell do we know where that is? Well, we know where it is, it's in the direction of Cygnus. It's just the, the local, it's the, mo it's the motion of the Earth in the rest frame of the galaxy. And we know what direction that goes in. So you, so you, you point your magnetic field orthogonal to that direction, the direction of Cygnus. So now you know how to set this up. Casper wind is more than just some drawings of blocks. Um, it's, there's a prototype. In fact, I think, the, so prototypes have run already in Mainz, and the full version of Casper wind is actually about to start taking data, or may even started taking data in Mainz. Um, Casper Electric is under construction in Boston University. Um, but I'm not aware of the status of it. It's a harder experiment, Casper Electric, because you have to apply an electric field. Electric fields are harder to control. The range of frequencies that this is sensitive to, you're tuning a resonance on the nuclear llama frequency. So your maximum frequency is set by the maximum value of the applied magnetic field. So you can only be resonant on axions up to a certain maximum mass set by how big magnetic fields you can get in the lab. You can fairly easily get a magnetic field up to 10 Tesla. If you pay a lot of money, you can get up to 15. And in very, very isolated environments, people, I think the maximum magnetic field anyone's made is something like 50 Tesla. But when you're talking about the, like these samples are going to be kind of centimeter cubed or smaller. They're very, very small. Um, in fact, I should have shown my picture that I have of Casper Wind. I'll just see if I can get up my phone in a minute. Um, so, yeah, you can't get these very high fields and you need to control your magnet. Your lower, free, your lower axial mass you can go to, though, is essentially zero. Um, the, the nuclear armor frequency just goes to zero as you take your magnetic field to zero. So the lowest frequency is really set by how well can you control your magnet. It's set by you know, what's, the, what's the margin of error on your magnetic field that you actually know it in. But in principle, you can go to very, very low masses. And we'll see that, um, that that's actually something Casper, Casper has been pioneering. So these are the forecasts for how well um, Casper Electric and Casper Wind can do. These are the early ones from these papers by Graham and Regendron and Budke. Um, I think I'll show some slightly updated ones as well. So again, we've got Casper Electric on the left, Casper Wind on the right. Casper Electric searches um, they have these two stage designs that they show. Um, the first one in orange um, is, you know, their, 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 their prototype, and then the red one is, um, you know, an upgrade. And then the dotted red line is set by just the squid, um, the squid mag the magnetometer noise. So that's in principle how far you could go if you could have infinite magnetic fields but they cut their forecasts off at their maximum magnetic field, probably like 10 or 15 Tesla. So they, in principle, can go up to about 10 to the minus 6, almost EV, so they could almost meet ABMX, but they only start to get down into the QCD axion regime below about 10 to the minus 8 EV. So they have some overlap with um, abracadabra, but they can scan to much lower masses. So they've shown here the QCD axiom online, and they've cut it off at the K constants of the Planck scale. So black hole super radius would rule out some chunk here. But Casper can detect the QCD axiom at low um, masses. And this would be really amazing, because in this case, you would really know that you've detected the QCD axiom. Because by definition, the QCD axiom is the thing that makes the dipole moment oscillate. If you detect any axiom with any other coupling apart from this, you don't know that it's the QCD axiom. You only know it's something that couples to E dot B. You don't know that it's the thing that solved the strong CP problem. Only Casper can tell you if you solved the strong CP problem. But I think that say ADMX did detect the axiom at 10 to the minus 6 EV, because you then know the frequency, you could probably build a very specialized Casper with very high magnetic fields and detect it on resonance. So you could probably engineer something to search at the one frequency you know using this principle in search on GD. Um, like on
So cash for wind is very promising. It only gets us these low axion masses. Um, it's a very hard experiment. The other thing to say about, um, sorry, Casper Electric. The other thing to say about Casper Electric, um, they've shown us some um, bounds up here from the static EDM, from the actual searches for um, the dipole moment um, using uh, ultra-cold neutrons. And we'll come back to those in a few slides time. Moving on to Casper Wind. Uh, cast the wind in their forecasts for their two stages in red and blue. Unfortunately, won't be able to reach the QCD actually online. But the parameter space up here for out dark matter is actually a more interesting parameter space than this one over here for GD. Um, again, for reasons that I'll discuss in a few slides time. And they also, in these plots, they stop at a lower mass of about 10 to the minus 14 EV. So, and I'll talk about that in a few slides time as well. How does Casper perform at even lower masses? We haven't made contact to fuzzy dark matter yet. Nothing has given us a way to detect fuzzy dark matter in the lab. So, Casper, as I said, is, um, is built. There are prototypes that have taken data um, at the University of Mainz and Dima Budka's lab. Um, one of the experiments that they've done already was called Casper Zulf. Um, so, so Zulf for zero to ultra low field, because to do the real resonance experiments, you need a very good NMR magnet. And they've, what they've done basically is they've split Casper wind now at Mainz into three different, two or three different experiments, yeah, three. So zero to ultra low field, mid field and high field, because you need different magnets for different purposes. Um, and I think the low field is the one they have the magnet for already. Zero to ultra low field is the one they did first because you don't need a special magnet. They operate in just kind of ambient magnetic fields. So just how well do they know the local magnetic field, I believe. Um, or just very low field. You don't need much of a specialized magnet to do it. So this is what it looks like. Um, and so I saw this when I was in mine. So this thing's about yay big, you know, kind of the size of like smaller than your head. And the sample, the NMR sample, is this tiny, tiny, tiny thing. And it will still be this tiny, tiny thing, even in the full versions. The, the volume of these samples that you use is actually very small. All of the, um, all the effort in building it is in building all the housing, the cooling, the magnets, and then analyzing the data. So, okay, this is Casper Zulf. And Casper Zulf has taken some data. And these are the exclusions that they get. So this is again on the plane of the nucleon coupling. The bound here is from supernova 1987A. And this is, this is the extracted bound of Casper Zulf. Um, I think this is a slightly old version. I think they have a new version where they analyzed a bit further down to meet the, these exclusions here that I'll talk about shortly. We talked in the, um, in the first few slides of last time about the, another effect of this coupling, of this axial fermion coupling, which was inducing new spin-dependent forces. That's the band here in blue. So the best laboratory bound of the axion-nucleon coupling was miles and miles from the astrophysical band. But these experiments are doing important work on this coupling because they, have, they are beating the laboratory bounds on new forces by three orders of magnitude. So they're not getting outside the astrophysical bounds, but they are the best laboratory bounds on this, on this coupling. <laughs> so, okay, here's the Casper Zulf um, analysis that they've done already. And then this is Casper Zulf phase two, which will start to get outside of the, um, the bounds from supernova 987A. You're sitting here at 10 to the minus 15 electron volts, which is about one hertz, and they go down to about 10 to the minus 16. So these guys are searching in the gap where there is no black hole super radiance constraint. So that's pretty good. Um, th this is a rate range that is not ruled out. Black hole super radiance, remember, excludes somewhere between about 10 to the minus 17 to about 10 to the minus 19 EV, and then again from about 10 to the minus 13. So Casper Zulf is in the not 
is searching for things that are not excluded by black hole super radiance. And they will start to get outside the astrophysical bounds soon. They won't reach the QCD line, but there are axion-like particle models that live down here. And I'll talk about these other bounds from the uh, neutron, to uh, neutron to mercury um, spin, spin free, llama, llama frequencies in a few slides time. Another experiment that works on a similar, similar principle to CASPEC is the GNOME. So the GNOME is, again, something that already exists. I've forgotten the name of what, um, one of the PIs, but Dima Budke is involved in this as well. So what the GNOME does is they say, okay, well, there are lots of magnetometry labs around the world. So why not correlate their data and see if together they can place some constraints on that? So they're not searching for axions necessarily per se. They're not in this special setup like Casper, but you've got lots of labs. And so you can search for the effect of magnetically coupling particles like an axion, which couples the spins, and by correlating their data. So the easiest thing they can do is they can imagine that the, the dark matter is made up of some kind of domain wall of axions. And then this wouldn't be, you know, a global domain wall. It would have to be some kind of thing just just within the galaxy, so some local structure of axions and that makes a domain wall somehow and passes through. So they can cut, so it's some local enhancement of the axion density that looks approximately flat in the lab frame. And that because this has a spatial correlation, you can search for axion couplings and you know, versus the size of the domain wall. And this is a collaboration between many labs. There are a few already involved. Uh, Mainz is one of them. You can see here Berkeley and Krakow. And um, they placed some constraints on axions. So this is on the um, axion decay constant, F, which goes like one over the coupling. So the astrophysical constraints, um, like supernova 1987A, now rule out the bottom part of this. And they can increase this coupling, but this bound by some, um, by some order of magnitude. Um, if they combine all of their data correctly. And they're sensitive to these, again, these very low axion meters because <coughs> they require the coherence scale on this domain wall to be of order, I think, the coherence scale between the labs. Um, the next experiment I want to talk about is called quacks. So we're, we're in the realm of testing axion couplings other than the photon coupling at the moment. The Casper tests the couple into nucleons. It's nuclear magnetic resonance. They're looking for effects of nuclear spins. We haven't placed any constraints on the axion coupling to electrons. But of course, electrons also have spins. So you can couple to electron spins. In, um, in the paper by Graham and Legendre, they, they, took, they, they mentioned this coupling and they showed the plot of constraints on it, but they said, we cannot think of anything to constrain this coupling. And quacks came along and changed that. So here is the axial electron coupling. You get some bound from new force searches. So looking for new forces between electrons, just like in the case of the nucleons. Again, not a very strong constraint. You get some bound from the cooling um, of white dwarfs. This is again the case where actually somewhere up here, there is the hint. For, there is a hint for the existence of this coupling because of the. Uh, because there is some anomalous cooling of white dwarfs, which could be explained by an axion somewhere up here. The QCD axion is this line, but in this case, the QCD axion means only DFSZ type models, because if you remember, only the DFSZ model couples directly to electrons because of its potential with the Higgs. So it's involved in giving the, so the Higgs has to have PQ charge and thus the electrons have to have PQ charge. KSVZ would be is loop suppressed relative to this. So you know, fewer is a magnitude smaller. Okay, so Graham and Jenkins I can't don't have any ideas. Um, but Quacks, which is an experiment operating now in Italy, they, again, it's taking data, it's in commissioning phases and um, reaching design sensitivity. Quacks came along just a couple of years later. So this is Quacks. They use electron spin resonance. I mean, when I, when I saw the Graham Regenerative paper, no constraints on electrons, I just Googled electron spin residence. And, you know, it's a thing. There's a Wikipedia page for it. So that's what quacks use. Um, 
And so they use what's called ferroelectric materials. So this is yig, yttrium iron garnet. So they get these spheres of this special ferroelectric material. Here it is, here's the tiny sphere, two millimeters in size. And they put it inside a resonant cavity that resonates at the, that allows them to detect any, any magnetization in this. And then I believe it's a similar, a similar principle to Casper. So they've ran with single spheres and they also are working on models with multiple spheres inside their cavity. So they have a magnetic field. So this is always what axion experiments uh, look like, as we saw for ADMX. You know, you, they, they sit inside a cryostat, they sit inside a magnetic field, um, probably a dilution refrigerator at some stage, right? Okay, so this is the 4K space. This isn't, this isn't hill fridge temperatures. But, okay, these experiments exist. I believe Quatch is at Gran Sasso. Um, it could be at another Italian lab, but I think it's Gran Sasso. So it's a ferromagnetic heliscope. So quacks can, again, compute their signal power as a function of the volume of the external cavity, the axion mass, the spin density, the um, signal coherence time, and their power is about 10 to the minus 26 watts. So they're really looking for small, small couplings. Here is the plane now that we're looking at, we're now looking at electron mass times the axion electron coupling and the way they've written it, the DFSC model is a straight line about at these masses, about two orders of, mag two orders of magnitude below the white dwarf cooling limit. Cast um, solar axion searches now put you, so sorry, not cast, so, solar axion searches, I don't know what these are, also place a bound. And this is quacks. So quacks, the bounds now look like the, uh, look like ADMX type bounds. It's a resonant experiment, they're scanning. Um, but now the frequency that they scan over is the electron llama frequency. Um, so it's a little bit higher. And yeah, so it has all the advantages of Casper in terms of scanning, but you measure this coupling. And it's an interesting coupling because of the white dwarf cooling hints. So they're sensitive here, they've covered you know, a very small range in these initial results of masses, you know, much less than order one. Um, and their rough scale is about 10 to the minus five electron volts. Quacks um, have been, I think, very, very cautious and very careful. They haven't published any, you know, here's a big forecast of the, of the amount of parameter space we're going to eat out for the QCD axiom. So I don't know what the, um, how well they intend to do um, but it probably wouldn't be, given this expression for the power, it wouldn't be too much of a hard exercise to, to work out where the signal to noise reaches one and make a forecast for, for quacks. Might be a fun idea, actually. Um, I think Naomi um, will be working on this. We'll, we'll be working on some forecast traction experiments this term, so maybe I'll get her to do this exercise. Okay, so quacks, very interesting again, because it's, it's charting a new coupling. And if, if the axion is detected but in any coupling, we want to be able to look on multiple couplings to try and work out what model is it. So, you know, if it's detected by ADMX, can you work out if it's a QCD axion, dipole moment coupling, then can you work out if it's KSVZ or DFSC by detecting the electron coupling? And of course, once you know that where it is, the experiments will become much easier because then you just make a fixed frequency experiment. So, I imagine that if ADMX discovered the axion tomorrow, quacks could <laughs> relatively quickly make a specific experiment that drilled down onto the DFSC line. So it's all incredibly exciting. Okay, so I've now talked about many experiments in the literature. And for the second half of this lecture, I'm gonna talk about two experiments in particular um, that I've been involved in um, so that I can give you a bit more detail on them. I've been a bit hazy on what's going on in these things because I, don't, I haven't worked on them directly. I've just summarized the papers. I'm going to tell you about two searches um, that I'm involved in directly. The first one is the neutron electric dipole moment and axion detection at the lowest frequencies. So this is a search that we've actually done and it's actually been 
published. So I wanted to, I said, what does this static limit on the neutron electric dipole moment tell us about the axion dipole moment coupling? So the static limit is remember that the dipole moment is less than about 10 to minus 26 e centimeters. So this was measured at some labs um, in ILL, Institute of Langevin in Grenoble, and in um, the Porcher Institute in Switzerland, and also at Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in the UK. And I said, well, okay, these guys, they just published their average data. They must have recorded their data over some time series. So let's just look for a time variation of the dipole moment. Turns out that this hadn't been done, and we, we called them up and we said, can we, can we do this? And they said, yes. Um, and here's some graduate students to do the analysis for you. So we were very happy. So the question is, what, you, what, I'll, I'll, how can this be used to detect, to detect ultralight axions? So time variation to dipole moment, ultralight axions, 10 to minus 22 EV, fuzzy dark matter, that if you turn that into hit, it's an oscillation about once a month. It's a very human time scale, so you can just look for time variation. There are two challenges to detecting fuzzy dark matter ultralight axions. The first is to build a model. Because all of what we talked about in, in Jens's lectures just assumed that there is a particle with a mass. And that works. You can just have m squared phi squared coupled to nothing and produce your particle by, by vacuum realignment and inflationary fluctuations. But then you can't detect it. It has no coupling. So the challenge is to try and actually build a model where you get the mass from something else and then it's coupled to the standard model and you know it's coupling. And the second challenge is that most experiments that I've told you about work by resonance and therefore probing low frequencies is hard. Getting a resonator at 10 to the minus seven hertz, you can't get a physical resonator that big because it would have to be you know, the size of the solar system or something, and we're even bigger. And as we saw with the magnetic searches, that would mean controlling your magnetic fields at very, very low frequencies. So this is what I did to try and look at this to start with. So first of all, built a model. So where are we? So this is a model that um, I worked on with, with Ginny Kim um, of the KS using Axion. And he said, I can help you build a model of an ultralight Axion. So we did that, we used um, discrete symmetries. We had a QCD axion and an axion-like particle. We made perpetually quinn symmetry discrete and we generated the mass from um, higher order operators, um, a couple of things like from the Higgs Z. Okay, and when we did that, I wanted to make a fuzzy dark matter model. So I put a band of probes from the high edge of the universe and I wanted to build um, Axion models that could be probed with the high of the universe. So I put my band in. And then in order to get the right axion relic density, I wrote the relic density in terms of the nucleon coupling. So nucleon coupling is proportional to one over the axion decay constant. I wanted to get in this gray band, and we built some models that lived in this red band. So these red models would give you the right dark matter density, look like fuzzy dark matter, and couple to the nucleon coupling. But we didn't know whether or not you could search for them with cast the wind. So there's cast the wind bounds that I showed before, um, cut off at 10 to the minus 14 EV. If you just assume a naive extrapolation, you can go like in a broadband sense to very low masses linearly, then cast the wind maybe could search for these. So this was the motivation. But it's about, as I said, about 10 to the minus 7 hertz. And we don't know what Casper and low field LMR can do. So Casper um, investigated the lowest masses they could go to in a series of in, in a series of papers. And um, this is one by Antoine Garçon. Um, I should really have the references on these slides. I'm sorry. So they looked at how well they could do. So the, um, this is the uh, relaxation time of the spins. So I think you can forget this y-axis. The x-axis is the axion mass they can probe. So, so via resonance, they can only go down to 10 to the minus 14 electron volts. But then they have this technique 
where you can split the, um, the line that you would induce by the axion and get it side bands, and then you could get with side bands all the way down to 10 to the minus 17 electron volts, but probably not below. So you still can't probe fuzzy dark matter directly using um, a resonant technique or even the side bands technique of CASPEN. Is there a way to search for ultralight axions in the lab? And the answer is yes, from this idea of just looking at the time variation of the neutron electric type moments. So this was um, a paper that we published in uh, 2017. New constraints on the axion gluon interaction strength. And the, uh, the first direct laboratory constraints on it, actually. Um, so we, we wanted to set a baseline for CASPER and search for ultralight axions. So we used archival data from the neutral electric dipole moment experiments, the ILL, along with some new data um, taken at the Paul Scherer Institute, which hasn't yet been published as a DN constraint, but we used it to search for axions. That's been being taken in the upgrade of NEDM for, from two, for the last 10 years. These are very hard experiments. And um, yes, yeah, so we used those to try and search for axions. So the neutral electric dipole moment experiment, NEDM, it measures energy shifts of ultra cold neutrons by Ramsey interferometry. So I'll try and remember how it works. So some neutrons get pumped into a bottle. Then the bottle is exposed to electric and magnetic fields and the neutrons process. And then if they have some precession caused by the dipole moment, it'll change their energies. And then when you flush them out, you'll be able to, you'll be able to spectroscopically tell the energy levels being different. So you're looking for very tiny shifts in the energy levels of the neutron that would be there if they had a dipole moment. And the rough energy resolution of this experiment is 10 to the minus 21 electron volts. This has nothing to do with the 10 to the minus 22 electron volts and such I'll, I'll constrain later. That's an oscillation frequency. This is energy resolution. So if you work out the, the amount of energy in an oscillation of a dipole moment, you can roughly forecast what range of axion couplings you would be sensitive to. So we did this and it looked quite promising. And so we contacted it, so myself and my collaborator, Malcolm Fairburn at King's College, approached um, some people from NEDM and we said, can we do an analysis? And they said, yeah, sure, here's some graduate students to do it. And there were also some other theorists looking at this with them as well. You have Jenny Stadnick and Dr. Van Baum. So we, we went right ahead. And the analysis I'm going to show you was done by um, Mikhail Rolick and Nick Ayres, um, two graduate students, Mikhail at the Paul Scherer Institute. Um, and he, goes, he, he finished his PhD last year from Zurich, from ETH Zurich. Um, and Nick Ayres, um, graduate students at Sussex in the UK, um, are one of the PIs of NEDM. So they did the analysis I'm going to show you. And this is them standing in front of NEDM. So this is the bottle that the ultra-cold neutrons get pumped into. And then this is all the housing for magnetic fields and electric fields. And these guys are really the experimentalists who, who run this. Um, they both spent weeks at the Porsche Air Institute monitoring the experiments and, and actually taking data. They, they understand it inside out. So they, so they did the analysis, um, but we worked quite closely together on it. And um, they were both really fantastic at, the, at doing this analysis and brought in some really like, nice new techniques that hadn't been used in this field before. So this is now recapping what I said already about Casper. Here's the interaction of Lagrangian of the axion with nucleons. So here it is coupling to GG dual, here it is coupling to the nucleon current. This is the spin precession that Casper wind looks for. And this is the oscillating dipole moment that Casper electric looks for. Both of these can be searched for using NEDM as well. So as well as the neutrons that go into here, they also have mercury that goes in at the same time as a co-magnetometer. Um, and OK, so you couple both to the, to the neutrons and to the mercury. To the, mer to the relative effect of the neutrons and the mercury that they that they search for. Okay, so the oscillating dipole moment is what NEDM was designed to do. It's designed to search for a static dipole moment. You analyze it over time, you get constraints on the oscillating dipole moment. 
the axiom wind you can also set for because it would give you a spin flip of the this also gives you a spin flip of the neutrons compared to the mercury acting like a pseudomagnetic field so what did we do we, we took the yeah uh, So you've got a very, you wouldn't have a very high density of them. You have a you have a lot of neutrons around. Neutrinos you could you would only see them if you had an axion coupling to neutrinos. The axion coupling to neutrinos is not present in either DFSE or KSVZ. Um, it's not present in KSVZ because in the standard model the neutrinos don't get their mass from the Higgs. Um, so the, the way the actual couple of neutrinos depends on how you talk about the neutrinos getting mass. And it's not present in KSPZ um, because you only give your, your new quark charge. There are constraints actually on the actual neutrino coupling, but I haven't, I haven't got them in these slides. Okay, so now we just, we, we need the data. We need to look for the time dependence of these effects. So the ILL data, the old ILL data was, was really easy to use and easy to think about. We would just, all, all they did is at the end of every day, they analyzed everything that they did with the neutrons and measured and wrote down the value of the, the, the upper limit of the dipole moment that they got every day. And they did that for six years. They published the average limit, but they just gave us the, the six years of archival data. The PSI data was given to us in a different format, but it allowed us to do more. So this experiment, this process of pumping neutrons into the bottle and sucking them out, and pumping them in and sucking them out, this runs on a cycle. And the cycle that it runs at is every 130 seconds. So the ILL data, you only get a data point on your time variation of the end every day. So you can't really look for time variation on timescales shorter than a day, approximately. But the um, PSI data that measures every 130 seconds, you have sensitivity to smaller timescale variations. The ILL data only gave us PN at the end of every day. But with the ILL data, sorry, with the PSI data, what you got is you, got a, you also got a relative measurement of mu n over mu hg. The uh, frequency of the neutrons relative to the frequency of the, of the mercury every 130 seconds, and that allows you to also search for the wind, the Casper wind effect. So you're not not just looking at the dipole moment, but you're looking at the direct um, the direct coupling to the nucleons themselves. So you get more out of the PSI data, and the PSI data is also a new experiment, better sensitivity, but we only had a few months worth of data, so it doesn't go to as low frequencies. You can't look for very long timescale variations. So what we did is we did a power spectrum analysis. So you just take your, um, you take your data measured over this time period, and you take a Fourier transform of it, and you ask, we do a least square spectral analysis of the time series, but in order to work out what your limit should be, you need to do lots and lots of Monte Carlos. So we did lots and lots of Monte Carlos and simulated what you would expect to see with random phases and worked out, for, and worked out not just the where you can set your 95% limit, but where you can set your one, two, three, four, five sigma false alarm thresholds. Because you, you don't just, because you want to know, like, what they, it, it's like the, Thing that we're all familiar with from LIGO, you need this false, these false alarm thresholds. Did I actually see something? And um, how many? So to claim that you saw something, you have to penetrate through the five sigma false alarm threshold. So this is what taking such a Fourier transform looks like. So the oscillation amplitude of the EDM here measured in units of 10 to the minus 26 in centimeters. That's about the scale of the of the uh, of these measurements. About the scale of the static limit. So your time series can't really go below the static limit in amplitude, obviously. And then when you take the Fourier transform of your data, here is the frequency. So the, so the power spectrum 
your constraint disappears beyond the inverse size of your data set because you can't tell constant offsets from oscillations anymore. So this disappears. And then we go up to the archiving time. So 10 to the minus 5 hertz is about an inverse day for ILL. Then we determine these Monte Carlo false alarm thresholds, which are these um, five sigmas here. The data is in black. The mean of your Monte Carlos with no signal is here. So that goes through what you actually see in the data, which is why you can infer that there is no signal at this level of amplitude across all of these frequencies. And then every time this black is above this green, you have a potential for a signal. But here, none of them penetrate the, the false alarm thresholds at the three, four, or five sigma level. You can do a little bit more than, than just looking at the false alarm thresholds. Let's say we did have one that went into a four sigma false alarm or a three sigma false alarm, would we, would we be worried about it? Not necessarily because you can check for other aspects of that signal that tell you, is this something that should be caused by an accident? So in the, in the ILL data I showed here, there were no significant excesses. Nothing got um, higher than the two sigma false alarm threshold. In the PSI data, there were, there were a few significant excesses, but none of them passed the, our cuts to say, is this a dark matter signal? That's because in, in the PSI data, we had different channels and, diff, and, and the measurement taken with different phases. So if it was a dark matter signal, you would expect to see it in, um, in channels where we mixed the data and things like this. Um, you can read about them in the paper. I can't remember the details now. But we had ways of telling whether or not it's a dark matter signal or not, and none of them passed those cuts. <clears throat> so therefore, we say we saw no signal, and we set 95% exclusions. So here are the exclusions on the oscillation amplitude. The long time base is the ILL data. So the ILL data was taken, archived on an inverse day, so its constraints disappear above an inverse day because you then you just can't tell from the, con from the phase offset. And then the inverse year, they took data for a few years. So beyond a few years, the constraint also disappears. The short time base is the PSI data. So we got a few months worth of their data. So it goes away a few times 10 to the minus seven. And then this fall here is inverse of 130 seconds. So then, and then the, um, the, the solid line is just a smoothed version of the, of the wiggly line. So you, um, you can now just turn this around into constraints on DM. So you write the oscillation amplitude in terms of GD in the way that I did a few, um, in the last lecture, and you can turn it into these constraints. So we got the first bounds in the laboratory on the axion dipole moment coupling, and they're expressed yeah. They beat the supernova bounds by orders of magnitude, many, many orders of magnitude. They stop, they don't go to very high masses because of the archiving time. In the old Casper papers and the um, Graham and Regendron papers, they had some projection for what this bound would look like from static EVM up here but you can't actually use the data there because it wasn't archived in such a time scale. So we, didn't, we don't project them all the way up. We just get these exclusions. We beat the supernova energy loss bounds. And we also beat, there's, a, there's another astrophysical constraint on this coupling from Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which, which um, I won't talk about. But we also beat the BBN bounds by a couple of orders of magnitude right in the fuzzy dark matter regime. If fuzzy dark matter coupled to the, the dipole moments of the neutron, we would be able to detect it. And then here's the bounds from high redshift galaxies. So we eat into this bit of fuzzy dark matter parameter space. There's some issue with models up here though. And the issue is that it doesn't really make sense to have a very light particle coupled to this operator. 
And that's because we know that for the PCB axion, this coupling generates a mass due to the instantaneous. So, and this generates a mass that should make you sit on the QCD line at that level of coupling. So to have a particle that is much, much lighter than the prediction from the QCD instantons would mean that you'd have to have some other contribution to the mass of the particle that cancels the contribution from QCD. So, mod, so things in the upper part, upper half of this plane are at least theoretically ambiguous. You don't know whether anything should live here. You can construct models um, where you fine tune this mass away. Um, and I've, written, and I've, I've written them down and we can talk about them if you want, but they're not, they're, they're not pretty. They're not pretty models and they involve a large amount of fine tuning. Um, so things in here aren't necessarily well motivated, shall we say. But it makes us, but then we're thinking about because we're going to have more data here. All of the, you know, the um, commissioning runs of Casper Electric are going to put constraints here before they reach QCD. So it's worth thinking about what means here because we're going to have data here. Okay, and we, we, so yeah, we've placed the first laboratory constraints on this coupling and we've exceeded the DBM bounds. It's very nice. And it's a low mass, um, so it's a low mass reference point for Casper. And it's laboratory bounds on fuzzy dark matter. So I think, I think this is very nice. Is there something similar to the scale of the Higgs that you have a hierarchy problem that you reach the highest scale of the world that you can agree with the Um, it's not the same. It's not the same as the hierarchy problem for the Higgs. It's not generated. It's not generated by like RG running and loops and things. It's just. It's generated by, by it's generated by directly by the shock operator from non conservative effects. Um, yeah, so it's not, it's not quite the same as the Higgs. Okay, the other bound that I already showed you um, that Casper Zulf uses again uses their baseline. This is again part of the reason we did this. We wanted to set laboratory baselines for Casper using existing data. Um, so this is using the uh, neutron mercury relative relative frequencies we could set bounds on the axion nucleon coupling. They beat the laboratory searches for new spin dependent forces by a couple of orders of magnitude, which is very nice, but they do not beat the supernova energy loss bounds. Okay, so that's that's all for fuzzy dark matter. So the context was again to remind you for this whole lecture, thinking about what we can do at low axion masses and high axion masses. So now I'm going to switch gears and go from fuzzy dark matter to constraints on the highest axion masses. And the highest axion masses in this context is going to be 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2 electron volts. Because um, I'll remind you that there's a constraint from supernova 1987a for the QCD axion means you have to get feet below about 10 to the minus 2 meters. So we're going to try and fill this gap between max and the upper bound on the mass for the, uh, uh, for the QCD axiom. Yeah. 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 2 volts. And this is something I've been working on a lot since I got um, here um, in Gerthingen. So the, this, this proposal is called 2RAD. Um, for topological resonant axion detection, and it works at the highest frequencies. So the, the group of us who have been working on this, I should add a few more faces to this now actually, um, but the group of us who are working on the, on the stuff that got published, or that will soon be published, um, is Maz, who's at the Max Planck Institute in Halle, Eric, who's over there, who's with us here in Gersingen, Casey, um, who's an who works on instrumentation at BBN Lab in um, Harvard. Libor, who's a graduate student and um, condensed matter theorist at Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. Maz is a material scientist, I should say, the Max Planck for microstructure physics. And Chris, who's also a condensed, uh, condensed matter experimentalist um, working in California. So this is a group of us who worked on this. So it, it, it's a big 
It's a big load of different people working in many different areas. It's a very um, interdisciplinary project. So I'm going to tell you about things that have nothing to do with particle physics and astrophysics, and many of them I don't know very much about myself, but I've learned about from this group of this very diverse group of, of, um, of interesting people. It's been lots of fun getting, getting people from so many different fields together to work on something. Okay, what's next? So I'll just reiterate the challenge of working at these high axion masses. So remember that the ADMX works in the gigahertz. High, higher axion masses are about 10 to minus 3 to 10 to minus 2 electron volts is terahertz. What is the terahertz challenge for axion detection? So this is the expression for the power generated in the electric field by, um, by the axion. So if you just write down the equation of motion that we saw in, um, in the lecture on ADMX, we have E double dot minus grad squared E equals some number A times the axial field, which is equal to square root rho uh, over M cosine M T. So you work out, the, so you just basically equate the amplitude of the electric field that you should create off resonance. It's basically this amplitude here. You take its modulus squared and you work out the power. So it's a half E squared times the volume that your electric field is in, times the frequency at which it's oscillating. This is the power in the electric field. E naught is just the magnitude of this term here. So it goes like the dark matter density, the square of the axion coupling, because you've squared this, one over the mass squared, the volume, etc. So you can now say, okay, what, what, what power is in this just in vacuum? Just in vacuum, my axion is making axion photon conversion in this room. What's the power contained in that? The, but the volume you can use is only the wavelength of the terahertz radiation, because it's only coherent over, over that amount. If you just measured it everywhere, you'd get, you'd get zero because the electric field oscillates. So the volume is C over terahertz cubed. So you substitute this in, G at the limit from the from cast from the helioscopes this power would be 10 to the minus 27 watts. It's five orders of magnitude below the power that ADMX tries to detect. Very hard. So of course you need to enhance it by resonance. So our method proposes to, to enhance this signal using a resonance effect, just like say ADMX does with cavity resonance, just like Casper does with nuclear magnetic resonance. We're going to find the magnetic resonance in the terahertz, and we're also going to try and increase the volume. So you can now increase the power by whatever your, your quality factor of your resonance is. And if you can make the volume bigger than terahertz, you can also boost the, boost the volume factor. And then furthermore, we're going to increase the signal to noise of the detection using a single photon um, detection method rather than like Dickey radiometer equation, which you use um, for something like ADMX. The advantage of this is that magnetic resonance, as I've said a few times now, decouples the resonant frequency um, from the volume. So if your resonance is, is a magnetic one, you can make your volume whatever you want. The, re because the resonant frequency isn't tied to the volume. If you can make a big magnetic sample, then your volume's large. Um, it also allows you to tune non, um, without using and without having anything mechanical that moves. So in order to get into the terahertz, the magnetic resonance in the terahertz is antiferromagnetism. So the antiferromagnetic exchange coupling is about one milli electron volt. So it places you in, in about the terahertz regime. That's because antiferromagnetic resonance, unlike the nuclear armor frequency that goes like this, four magneton times B, it goes down to zero and then exchanges really. Antiferromagnetic resonances go like some, um, some coupling times the magnetic field plus a constant. And the constant is avoided the antiferromagnetic exchange with it, and that's a milli electron loss. Antiferromagnetism 
sits at terahepton of water. So we're going to use anti-ferromagnetic materials. And, this is, and so this is comparing it now to the other two magnetic resonances. Casper uses nuclear magnetic resonance, places you for you know, reasonable magnetic fields at about megahertz, which cause your signal power drops in magnetic fields, so you don't want to go too low. And quacks, that electron coupling that we saw before, the electron moment puts you at about a gigahertz. So anti-ferromagnetic resonance puts us further. And then we're also going to use, in a way that I hope to explain, uh, these materials called topological insulators. So if I just use the antiferromagnetic resonance, I would be coupling to the electrons. So it's, it's electrons and antiferromagnet. Remember, you've got, instead of in a magnet, your electron spins all line up. Antiferromagnet, they're opposite to each other. So naively, to couple to that resonance, you need to couple to the electron spin. Um, but what I'm going to do is using this trick of put it, of make, making an antiferromagnetic topological insulator couple you to the axion photon coupling. And that's because we're going to be able to get down here in this line. So I want, I want to couple to the axion photon coupling and I want it so that I can get down to there. And also getting to the axion photon coupling allows us to use the whole volume of the material. If I was coupling directly to the electrons, I'd be only be able to use the volume of the Brillo Anzo in the unit cell. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to do some gymnastics that couple you to the photon coupling and do damage. And to do that, I'm going to have to introduce something called an axion quasi particle. And this is why this project is really cute as well, because um, I'm going to use an axion quasi particle. Um, to detect the axion dark matter. So axion quasi particles, what are they? Anyway, my animations are a bit off. Okay, so in condensed matter in the condensed matter system, the chain Simons term. So I may not have used this phrase already. Terms like this, GG dual, things that I emphasize are topological, they don't couple to the metric. Um, they're called chain Simons terms after two people called chain Simons. So FFG was also a chain Simons term. So the chain Simons term um, in condensed matter arises in magnetoelectric materials, things that couple electricity and magnetism, which is E dot B. So um, as I said, um, in a way that I haven't fixed yet, sorry, Daniel, um, if T and CP are conserved. The, the coefficient in front of this term, if you have this term in your material, is locked to zero, just like it was for the dark matter axiom. This effect um, is predicted to occur in topological insulators. So a topological insulator, and this is where I got into this, a topological insulator is something that in its effective Lagrangian in the material has a non-zero electromagnetic anomaly. One way of classifying topological insulators. Topological, topological insulators, however, have T, they're T invariant, so they can only have a coefficient of this term being zero, which is a normal insulator of pi. And this term having a coefficient of pi is what defines a topological insulator. Normally, you wouldn't be able to detect the presence of this term, but that's where the topological bit comes in. They have a special structure that allows you to tell whether or not it's zero or pi. The Condensed matter theorists can write down what this is, um, and you can compute what the, what the theta term is in your material via this integral over the brillo zone of these objects, which is the very phase gauge field for the block wave functions in band alpha. So these are your band wave functions and band states, alpha k, beta k. This is the, the position operator um, in Fourier space, d by dk. So you have these um, very phase gauge fields, and you can write down what theta is in terms of your electron band structure. So if you have a special electron band structure, that's where the topological bit comes in. Theta can be um, not zero, but it could be pi. So in a topological insulator, this term, the axion, the you know, quasi-particle axion is not a particle, it's just a, a number. It's locked to zero pi by t invariance. However, you can have dynamical axion fields, 
quasiparticles in magnetic topological insulators. And this is why I was interested in it. I was talking to this guy, Maz, um, at a meeting for the, for the Humboldt, for the Humboldt Stift, I mean. And he said, yeah, I work on these, work on these things called topological insulators, I have E.B. terms. I was like, oh, cool, that's what I work on. Um, I wonder if there's like a, a laboratory analog for dark matter axions. I went and met him and we were talking and he, and then he stumbled across this paper. I was like, this is it. This is it. This is interesting. So initially I was interested in this as an analog, an analog experiment for axions. We can get a condensed matter system that looks like dark matter axions and play loads of games, like say, set up one of these materials and do a light shining through a wall experiment or something like that with, with a quasi particle. Okay, so, so, so this is dynamical axion field and topological magnetic insulators. I'll get to the dark matter detection shortly. So at the moment we're just thinking, okay, there's some quasi particle that looks like a dark matter axion. These materials are, um, these ones haven't been realized yet in the lab, but it's a whole industry working on these types of materials, direct materials, topological insulators, because they're useful for, um, they're useful for spintronics, they're useful for trying to make um, hard disks and improve disk technology and computers. They're built in machines like this at Halleck. So it's not just, you know, I'm not just going to be completely fantasizing about these things. I know someone who can build these materials. This is the type of machine that they use to build these materials. This is a thing, this is a machine they call Mangro, and they make thin film heterostructures. It's a hybrid deposition tool. So what you do is you send in your sample on this stage here, and then the sample moves along, and there are these guns here, and the guns shoot different materials onto your substrate. So you build up something like iron doped bismuth selenide by having a gun here that says bismuth on it, a gun here that says selenium on it, and a gun here that says iron on it. And you shoot them together, and you make it. This is a, the this is a theorist concept of what it does, but it really does say on the inputs of this good bits with. <laughs> you really get your hands on what's happening. So they make these materials in big machines like this and then they test them. And this is the kind of thing that's used to make, you know, a hard disk in your computer. This is the, this is the technology that's used to make them. Um, okay, so in order to have these axion quasi particles, you need to, your materials need to pass some, some tests um, my condensed matter theory colleague, uh, Labor, um, has been calling these tests the world check criteria. If you meet a condensed matter theorist, there's loads of papers about these axion quasi particles, by the way, and um, they're very popular. And they all refer back to a paper in 87 by Wilczek. They don't go all the way back to Petche and Quinn because they're not interested in the particle physics axion, they're interested in the quasi particle. And Wilczek started talking about this in, in 87. So these are the material properties you need to get an axion quasi particle. They define it as a quasi particle coupled to E dot B. That's the defining property of an axion in condensed matter. So you need the effective chain time and the end time. You also need to have the Dirac equation for your electrons. Your band structure needs to be sufficiently well described by, by the Dirac equation. And then because that's what gives you this, this non-zero term from that integral before. And then you also need to have what they call variable Dirac masses. You need to be able to, there needs to be some property in your system that allows the band structure to change dynamically in order to have a dynamical axiom. So one requires magnetoelectric polarizability, something in your Lagrangian depends on E and B. Two, requires you to have a material that has direct quasi-particles in. This is what the topological insulators have. But in order to make that term not just locked to zero or pi, you need to break time reversal symmetry. And that you can do with magnetic fluctuations. So just like we heard about in lecture one, magnetic fluctuations break time reversal invariance because you can think of a magnetic field as being caused by a current in some direction, here's your magnetic field. By reverse time, the current goes in the other direction and thus the magnetic field changes direction. So magnetic fields break T reversal. So if you can, use, so if you can put magnetic fluctuations inside 
a topological insulator which already satisfies one and two, then you will satisfy three and you will have a dynamical axiom here. So, so you can break time reversal invariance, then you get now an analog axion field. So here is the Lagrangian for the analog axion, some collective mode of the electron spins. Here's its Lagrangian, and it's described by some kind of spin wave, like a, it's a magnon. So this thing is related to a magnon with some fluctuation in the spin wave, Nell vector. So what it is, is you've got your Nell vector, which tells you about how, um, what the anti-ferromagnetic order parameter is. So here's A and B, you've got some lattice and you've got spins on some site. You have anti-ferromagnetic order if on average, the difference between this and this is positive. So if, if, there, if you have on average, this type of alignment, you have an anti-ferromagnetic order. That's called a non-zero null vector. <coughs> So then fluctuations in the value of this vector from point to point. So, so if, the, if the magnitude of the spins is allowed to go like this, so you can get that from a kind of rocking, you've got a longitudinal fluctuation in this vector, that's what this field is. And it would have this following Lagrangian. So the spin waves have some effective mass. That's an antiferromagnetic frequency. And they couple to E dot B. Now this is where the magic of using it to detect dark matter actually and starts to appear. So we've got these spin waves and these spin waves couple to E dot B. We've got antiferromagnetic longitudinal magnum. And now we can use it to detect dark matter. Because yes. When, when it's zero, you say it's magic to those frequencies. It's like yes. insulated. Yeah, it's an ordinary insulator. Pi. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's a phase transition between normal insulator and topological insulator, where the vacuum value of this field goes from zero to pi. So what we so this is the fluctuation of the field away from its vacuum value. So if you're in the topological insulator phase, this has some value pi, and these are the fluctuations away from pi. And people have um, claimed to have realized in the lab what they call axion insulators, which are um, materials that no longer have just, just zero or just pi, but they have a phase where it's something between zero and pi. And these are called axion insulators. It's still pinned by time reverse. It's still pinned to a value. It's not allowed to fluctuate, um, but it has a value that's not zero or pi. So you use this as a way to describe different phases. Okay, so now let's write down the whole Lagrangian, um, not just the axion quasi-particle term, but let's include photon fluctuations and see what happens. So now here's the photon fluctuations, E. Inside this material, there is a non-zero E dot B. So the electric field couples to the axion quasi-particle, and this is how it couples to the axion quasi-particle. The electric field, also drives the axion quasi-particle, like this. So I work out the equations of motion for my electric field. Here's the term we saw before in a material with dielectric constant epsilon. Here's the equation of motion for the axion quasi-particle, but there's now coupling between the axion quasi-particle and the electric field. And this gives you an effective mass to the electric field. So this is why I'm now able to control the mass of my resonance that couples to the dark matter axion. So before, in the paper that I showed you, this now relatively famous paper, this one, they wrote down exactly these equations of motion, these ones, but they weren't interested in dark matter axioms. Well, I did, we say, well, what if the dark matter axions drive this? Then you've now got some non-zero mass matrix for these two excitations. <laughs> So, the, so the, our observation is that dark matter axion source the electric field inside the topological insulator. The chain Simons term, E dot B coupling, that's this term here, this term here, um, and also this term on the black this, couples the electric field to the spin waves by a linear mass mixing. So inside this, top, this magnetic topological insulator, 
E and ma the electric field and the magnon mix. So you end up with um, two, you just diagonalize this matrix, you end up with two propagating modes called polaritons. Anytime a, 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 a photon mixes with something, it's called a polariton, you have this inside plasmas as well. So the electric field mixes, it's been way of giving you two um, states, two polaritons, phi plus, phi minus. And the key thing is that the mass of, the, of this polariton state is set by the value of this coupling here, the value of this coupling here, and this mass here. So you've got some state that is driven by the dark matter axion, but has a mass that is of order terahertz that you can tune. So now I've achieved my goals that I wanted to achieve. I have a tunable terahertz resonance, it's magnetic, and I can make it in whatever volume I can make these materials. So, how do we do it? And I've only got five minutes. So this is the um, magnum dispersion on our diamond glasses. This is what I wrote down here. It has some value that scales with the applied field strength H and some value that um, some value at zero field. This is the magnum dispersion. You could make this can be measured, and I intend to measure it using uh, neutron diffraction. It depends on the on the exchange coupling, the antiferromagnetic, the antiferromagnetic exchange. That's what sets the milliEV scale. So the mass of the axion quasi particle is of order milliEV, and then it scales with the applied magnetic field. This is what we need. And now we can use these things as dark matter detectors. Antiferromagnetic topological insulator and dark matter detectors. So I said we have these two polaritons, these two degrees of freedom. You can just work out their dispersion relation from the equations of motion before and diagonalize them. They have some piece that's proportional to the spin wave mass and some piece that's proportional to the um, chain Simons coupling. So the chain Simons coupling kind of gives a direct mass to the photon here as well. This is quite important. And then you can also work out the eigenvectors of that system. You can work out how much of the phi plus and phi minus polaritons live in electric field and how much live in, in photons. It's just diagonalizing equations of motion. And then, of course, if this was a perfect resonance, so now I've just got this, this is my resonant frequency, which I can tune to match the frequency of the axion. And if I take wave vector equal to zero, I'm talking about coherent oscillations of the whole material. So now my volume is just volume of the material. And I just tune basically m squared plus b squared. Both that um, b squared depends on the magnetic field, as does m squared. So I've got a tunable frequency. If I just put that on resonance, I would get infinite power if there was no damping. Of course, there are losses in the material. There are losses to the walls which I'm going to use. And then, there's pro and then there's also some magnetic damping, something like Gilbert, like Gilbert damping. So this is the frequency. You can scan the frequency by varying the magnetic field. And the mode you want to hit is the mode at the inverse side of, size of the material here. So some non-zero, but, but small k of order your material size. And you can vary the frequency here. The lowest you can go is about this constant in your in your spin in your antiferromagnetism and then the highest you can go is again just limited by the magnetic field you can apply so i assume that we can go up to 10 tesla okay so now we can scan for axions be between about one and three milli electron volts and you can work out the signal to noise from the power this is the power and it's basically, it's kind of like Mad Max. We imagine that some, some, there's a dielectric boundary. Some photons will get emitted in the way I described for Mad Max. If you plug in my rough parameters, let's say one centimeter cubed of sample, you can imagine making a centimeter cubed of these things. You'd need to do that to do neutron diffraction anyway. Then we get about one photon per minute. That's where we use um, a single photon detector with very low dark count rate. You only get one dark photon every um, thousand seconds. So you can get very high signal to noise. 
And then you just wait for longer and you drill all the way down to the QC of mine. This is the idea of what it would look like. It looks like something like Mad Max, but with a single disc, a disc of this material, a mirror behind, you apply a magnetic field, the, the dark matter axion is a wave here, apply a magnetic field, it induces these axion polaritons inside your material that have a terahertz mass. But then because you've got some boundary here, in order to match the dielectric boundary conditions, you emit terahertz photons from your material and you detect these with a single photon detector called a quantum dot. Of course, we haven't built this yet. We don't even have the materials, um, but we are, we are imagining what we can do. I imagine that if we can make one centimeter cubed of material, and then I say, okay, what if we could get, make a hundred of these, which I'm told is what one postdoc in one year could manufacture if they weren't flat out. So if you made a hundred of these and put them together in, in sort of array, like, like Mad Max did, we could increase our effective volume. And then we could possibly take this even all the way up to the De Broglie wavelength. This is what we think we could do. And this is my last slide. Um, here's the action photon coupling, here's the mass. This is what we think we could do with one centimeter cubed of sample. We wouldn't be able to reach the QCD line. But with a hundred centimeter cubed of sample, we could. And this is assuming a total scan time of about a year. And then if we could go up to this De Broglie wavelength limit, we could drill down even below the QCD axiom line in one year. So of course the, 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 the challenge here is big. We don't even know that these materials exist. Um, we have a model for two of them. You could have iron doped bismuth selenide or, pros, or possibly um, chromium oxide in some particular crystal structure called alpha chromia. But we need to make the materials. We then need to test them to find out that they have this axion quasi particle, which has also never been observed. But if they have it, then we could detect the dark matter axion. And it would be very much, you could take the sample that we have, say we had a sample, you would put it in, you could possibly do this at the Casper facility. So using the same magnets that Casper use, you would be able to do this. You would need a slightly different detector. But the, but the infrastructure would be the same as Casper. So it's not, so that, that's, that's what I'm hoping we can do is, is piggyback off some of the R&D from Casper. Okay, so that is the end of um, this Axion Cosmology course. We've gone all the way from models of the QCD axion, models in string theory, production of dark matter axions, Constraints on very light axions from cosmological structure formation. Constraints from gravity for pressure oscillations and pulsar timing. Gravitational microlensing searches for the QCD axion. And then we came down to searches on Earth, which we talked about in the last two lectures. I think it's a very exciting time to be studying axions because we're making progress everywhere. The, the, the constraints on ultralight axions are starting to hit black hole super radiance bounds, which themselves start to meet the direct constraints in the lab. And in the lab, we've got a whole range of new ideas that are going to fill the entire parameter space from those black hole super radiance bounds all the way up to the heaviest values that the QCD axiom can be up towards an electron volt. And if we do that, we'll really have tested fundamental ideas in um, quantum chromodynamics and in string theory and will have constrained particle masses over about 33 orders of magnitude. So I think there's a lot of progress going on, and, and particularly here in Germany with these new experiments. So it couldn't be a more, couldn't be a more exciting time. I hope I've made some of you, uh, given you some new knowledge that you didn't have, or made you excited um, about this subject. Um, so are there any final questions? And sorry for going over by five minutes. All right, yeah. I mean, if we assume that you could produce this material, then uh, what would um, you take? Like, you, you would put it in the detector and then axion dark matter will interact with this and yeah. it leads to energy tolerance for the experiment. It doesn't need um, to a phase transition. You have to already be in that phase 
you have to already be in the um, antiferromagnetic phase um, in particular, so below the known temperature. But what it does is when the dark matter, once you apply a magnetic field, the dark matter oscillations set up the production of spin waves in the material, the production of magnons. So they, they, they would drive an oscillation in, in the order parameter. If the oscillation was too big, you would drive a phase transition, a phase, a phase transition. So we use that as a kind of zeroth order way of saying, um, even if you don't detect the emission of photons from your material, if the axion, if the axion interaction was large enough, it would drive a phase transition. And we've assumed that the interaction is small enough that instead it only induces um, magnons, propagation of magnons. Yeah. Um, assuming that one wouldn't detect any axions also in the field scale for the photon axions, what would, what's your opinion that the impact of that for the string theory? Um, so, right, so for the string theory um, models, I mean, so there are basically two uh, classes of string theory compactification. Um, and they set the axion decay constant. So the, there are the kind of maybe more canonical small volume compactifications. The volume of the compact space is about 100 or so in string units. And these are called KKLT compactifications. In those, that case, you get gut scale decay constants roughly, because the decay, decay constant is roughly compact scale over the volume. And we are starting, we will get constraints on, on gut scale um, axions. Gut, um, from, you get constraints on gut scale axions from gravitational physics from the C and B and everything, because there you, you get more dark matter if the decay constant is larger. So it's very nice you get, um, you can rule out kind of gut scale stuff with gravitational probes. The other type of string compactification is the so-called large volume scenario. Um, and that's because the volume is large. It's about 10 to the six in string units. So the axion decay constant is much smaller. It's about 10 to the, 10 to the 12 GeV. In those cases, you don't get much dark matter, but you do get a quite, you, all the couplings are larger because all the axial couplings go like one over the decay constant. So the large volume scenario is tested quite strongly by things like the stellar, by things like stellar cooling. So stellar cooling at the moment is about 10 to the nine GeV in decay constant, but um, efforts to go, but get, go to larger decay constants say from astrophysical sources put constraints there. So they kind of come in from both directions. Um, you know, of course, there are like model dependent factors. But if I, if I extended this plot all the way down to um, ultralight axions, you'd see the, the direct searches kind of come down here. And the cosmological searches kind of come up here. But there's still a desert in which they probably don't meet. And that desert is, probably, is, decay, is intermediate decay constants of about 10 to the 14 GeV. So I don't, I, I don't think you can get everything. And there's a lot of model dependent statements to bring them in. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are these two classes and they're searched by two different, by two different things. It's hard to say, it's hard to say anything like, It's hard to say exactly what you would learn about string theory though, but you could place, I mean, I mean hmm. I'm trying to think if I've got anything more sensible than that to say. I don't think I have. So you've always, so, so there's a lot of uncertainties in what is the particle mass. So you have some particles that remain light that get their masses from these non-perturbative effects and remain very small. But there, is all, there are ways to make all the particles get masses at the string scale or, ve or a very large number of them. So, um, I mean, so for example, you could have a situation where like, half of your axiom masses are projected out to string scale masses or all of them apart from one and then you end up with one massless axiom 
But if that, if that massless axion was a uh, mass below the Hubble scale, which happens in some of in these crazy scar correcting this, but your decay constants below the Planck scale, it doesn't contribute to the dark energy, but it's not strongly coupled enough to hit the constraints from cast. That's why I'm saying there is a kind of like desert in between, and if your particles lived in this desert, um, you wouldn't detect them. And th there are always ways to make all of your, all or almost all of your, your fluctuations heavy. Um, and of course, the, the number of axions you have depends on this uh, topological invariant. And so, like with the black hole super radiance constraints, I think you, could, you can rule out large numbers of axions because then if there are lots of them, some of them should land somewhere where you rule it out. But if you were in a model with a small number of axions, then you could just be unlucky. So I think it's hard to say anything like really generic. Um, there are always ways out, but you might feel that you're more squeezed in terms of model building. And that would be probably the best scenario is if you really squeeze the model building, then it would really restrict what string theorists are allowed to do. And that might, might allow them to make more, more precise predictions about something else. Like you might restrict yourself to have, um, you're only allowed Calabi L manifolds with a, you know, small Hodge numbers or something. And that could make their task very much easier because there are many fewer manifolds with small Hodge numbers. So, that's probably the uh, optimistic outlook. Right. Well, if there are no more questions, then that's the end of the course, and uh, hope you enjoyed it.